Jesus presented as the Redeemer. Now, um, when we normally think about Christmas time, we think of Jesus being presented as a baby. And there's a lot of symbolism in this part of Luke. Um, you know, Luke was Jewish. He was also a doctor. So he was into making sure that his case was presented that people could understand it and that he could prove it. It was a provable case in, his, in, in what he wanted to do. So he is talking about the time period when, when Jesus was born. And now this story that we're that Stace is going to read for us in a moment will take us to the point of where uh, Jesus is actually being presented in the temple. So uh, just kind of envision this, that uh, it was Jewish tradition. It was actually part of the law that you are to take uh, the male uh, to be circumcised at eight days of age and give him a name at that time. So Jesus, you're going to read uh, here that Jesus was presented at eight days, circumcised and given the name Jesus, just like the angel told Mary and Joseph to name him. All right. Um, Sometimes you hear me uh, when Josh is in the room, I'll say, uh, yes, you are. Uh, Yezu. Um, that really is the, the, the Hebrew or Aramaic pronunciation. Uh, the Greek translation is Jesus. But if, if we were all Jews today in those days, 2000 years ago, and we walked in the room, uh, more than likely you, you would say Yezu. And uh, that would be his name for Jesus. Okay, so um, he was given that name at eight days. And then again, it is law that you are to take a male at 40 days of age and present him to the priest in the temple and offer a sacrifice, which is generally considered um, a time to confirm the baby into the Jewish faith. Also to um, offer up any kind of of way to, to, to clear the pathway for, for redemption or for sin for that baby. Uh, the males were done at 40 days of age and the females or the girls were done at 80 days of age. Now, what's further interesting that Luke goes into such minute detail that if you understand what it means, it makes a lot of sense to you. So she's going to read for us that they offered a pair of doves or two young pigeons. That tells us that Joseph and Mary were probably on the lower rung of the economic ladder because that would not be the normal sacrifice for a male child, particularly for the firstborn, because that's the that's the uh, uh, the keeper of the whole family. Right. They're going to inherit everything in theory in Jewish law. And so they would actually present a lamb or a bull calf or something of that nature. But if you are. <clears throat> Not necessarily poor, but again, on the lower side of the economic ladder, you would be allowed to do two turtle doves or two doves or two pigeons, right? Two, they're, they're pretty, they're relatively inexpensive. And even people who are on the lower economic rung could afford that. So we know by reading that, that they aren't in the upper tier of any kind of socioeconomic ladder. Okay. Um, now you're going to hear about. Simeon and Anna, both older people in the temple. They're there all the time. Um, it's thought that S Simeon was probably uh, a Pharisee. Um, he was in the line of those who were elders in their church. So, um, but he, he's one who seems to be focused on the Messiah. That, that seems to be where his heart is. Now, the reason this is important it just so happens, I've told you this before, of the 66 books in the Bible, of the 31,173 verses that are in there, okay, um, not all of them are in chronological order. They're not all in chronological order. So it just so happens, though, that the last book in the Old Testament, when it was canonized, when, when those faithful people gathered together at the Nicene um, uh, assumption of, of the canonization, they put Malachi as the last book in the Old Testament, and that happens to be chronologically correct. It's the last book the prophet Malachi spoke, and it was actually over 400 years before Jesus came. So there's a 400-year drought 
when nobody who's Jewish got to hear any current words of God. All they had was the old prophets. I think that's important. And here's why. I don't mean to get off on a tangent, but that's important for us as people of faith that God doesn't always answer prayers in the time period that we think he should. So it's been 400 years since any Jewish person has heard from a prophet that is recorded and we get to see. Okay. And there's Simeon, who is an old man, which means he has prayed all of his faith days for the Messiah. So think of decades and decades and decades of praying and praying and praying and waiting. And suddenly his prayers answer. Okay. But for Jewish people, it's 400 years. So just kind of keep that in perspective as you think about that. All right. And then Anna is a special lady. Um, and this conflicts with a lot of people in the New Testament teaching sometimes, particularly in certain churches. Because is described by a prophet. Or a prophet. Um, and yet she speaks. So she is speaking in church. And this throws some churches off where they say, well, women aren't supposed to speak. Women aren't supposed to prophesy. But she did. Okay. And it just so happens that Luke records it and we now read about it all the time. So it's kind of cool to kind of expand the, the, the place of some people's minds when it comes to their religion. So just wanted you to be aware of some of that. Um, I also want you to think, too, that this is this is really simple, but but it is important. Um, Anna. Had been married for seven years. It's hard to say what that time period would be, but generally for a Jewish girl, she was married in her teens, unless there were some extenuating circumstances, sometimes in her mid-teens. So let's just assume she waited till she was 20 when she got married. And so it says that it says she lived with her husband seven years after marriage. So let's just say 20. She got married late, 27. OK, but then it says that she was a widow until she was 84. Now, for those of you that are going to Virginia Tech and earning your doctorate degree, in chemical engineering, how many years is that? <laughs> oh, no, I put the pressure on her, Brian. I'm sorry. This is the first number. Wouldn't pay attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it is. So I want you to think about the fact of she had been a widow that long, had stayed in the temple night and day, never left, it says, and yet she didn't become better. So she was without a husband, which means that she probably, it doesn't mention children, so she probably is having to be under the care of somebody because women didn't have the economic benefit. And yet she never became bitter. She had known sorrow. She had been lonely and she didn't become bitter. And that's a really cool little side lesson that we can all kind of think about. All right. So. <laughs> I was this close to being bitter. I was this close. Beverly's phone went off and interrupted the entire class. Okay. Thank, thank the Lord that didn't happen to me. That had been so embarrassing. Oh, gosh. Okay, Stacy, would you be so kind to read for us? In keeping with our tradition, since we're hearing the Holy Word of God, let's stand up. Stacy's reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 40, if you're following along at home. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel, even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses, after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. 
the Holy Spirit was upon him, and he revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed him, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of, the, of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna, a prophet who was also there in the temple, she was the daughter of Phanel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. Thank you, Stacey. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. Okay, as we look at our outline, I had already given you kind of the, uh, the, the setting for this. So I put in your outline that Simeon saw something very special. And if you notice in verse 30, this is the way he says it. For my eyes have seen your salvation. He's, he's praying out to God. He's praising God out loud. For my eyes have seen your salvation. So what does Simeon see that the other religious people don't see? I mean, how's he seeing this? By the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes, that's that's how he does see it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Beverly, I'm sorry, what did you say? Well, uh, it's it's fair. Shouldn't a prophet notice things, or shouldn't godly people notice things? Um, know it. Know it. Um, even even through the Holy Spirit. So I want you to think of this. There's probably no scripture except a little bit in Isaiah that talks about the Messiah coming as a baby. I mean, Isaiah mentions, you know, that that the virgin will be uh, with baby, uh, but that's it. And and so it's not it wouldn't be normal for even those people who were very religious and, and very godly to get that on their own. It has to be something that's revealed to them in a special way. But but the question really becomes is. Why did Simeon see it and the other? Why didn't the other Pharisees see it? Well, obviously, that it was revealed to them somehow, as it was to Joseph and Mary. <clears throat> he, he probably, somebody probably came and visited him in the night, and it just wasn't reported. We, don't, we do know that it's revealed to him by the Holy Spirit in verse 26. So I think, Beverly, you're right. We, we all, what I want to sensitize you to is we all discover things differently it, it it's not always an angel of the lord that appears to us sometimes we we sit in silence and we pray and and it just kind of becomes known to us right it, it kind of dawns on us we say it dawned on me right or yeah absolutely and and remember during Simeon's day the holy spirit was not indwelling in people yet okay the holy spirit visited but didn't indwell yes could it be a mindset and how he was expecting it and he wanted to see it where cuz in the previous times you hear how the pharisees were like closed minded and only were cared about themselves could they could he be one that was actually seeking after the lord in that time of drought 
and then it was revealed to him because he was faithful during that time of drought. Yeah, that's very well said. Um, uh, so if you didn't hear on on Zoom, uh, Isaac was saying that it's it's just a mindset, right? He he was he was watching, he was ready, he was waiting, and and that's a valuable point for us to see. Sometimes as Christians, we aren't waiting, we aren't watching, we aren't vigilant. Um, so if you think of those who deer hunt, if you went out into the woods and you didn't pay attention to your surroundings, how many deer go by you and you don't even notice it, right? And so um, I have some friends who unbelievably every year they seem to get deer, big deer, right? And I hunt in the same plots before that they have and don't see any deer. And they'll laugh. One of them said, were you sleeping because there was a nice eight point buck that went by you earlier this morning? And I said, well, yes, I was. So, and he saw it. I didn't. He said it was within 20 feet of you. I said, well, good for him. He survived another day, right? And and so, you know, we we sometimes miss things because we're not, we don't have the right mindset, like Isaac said. That's good. Now, there's something else that, that I want you to get. So I asked the question, why does Simeon see that the religious people don't see? Or what does Simeon see that the religious people don't see? So he, he, he did have that mindset. He was preparing. He was preparing for God to answer his prayer. It had been revealed to him years before that he would not die until he saw the salvation of the Lord. And it says that he's an old man. So he knows if God's going to God's gonna honor this. So I'm getting older. It's going to happen. So it's kind of sooner. It's it's like little children. You talk about Christmas in January, next Christmas, and it's too far off. But as it gets closer, they get more excited about it. Maybe that was him as well. Plus, there's also it says the Holy Spirit moved him to go there. Yep. And Rusty, Rusty said, yes, the Holy Spirit had moved him to go there. You're exactly right. So kind of prepping. Okay. And God does that with us today. I don't want you to miss that. God preps us for things today. We just need to be sensitive to it. When we're not focused, we miss things. Deer walk right by us because we're asleep. Okay. 34, I, I put in your outline. What does Simeon mean here? Let me read 34 to you. Um, he says, this child, I'm sorry. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. So what does he mean? My uh, interpretation on what I have is that um, to those who reject him, he is a stone of stumbling. Those who receive him are raised up. Okay, good. So Laura said uh, that he's a, he's a stone of stumbling for those who don't believe. To others, he raises them up, those that believe. That's a good way to put it. So, so think of this context. Uh, Simeon is saying that, you know, God is revealing to him that there are many that will fall because of Jesus. And there are some that will rise because of Jesus. And when it means fall, it doesn't mean necessarily in the eyes of man, but it does mean in the eyes of God. Beverly? Because um, they're made aware of that. Jesus is going to bring us the message. And so people are the ones that were rejected will fall, and the ones that accept it will be risen up. Yeah, Beverly is saying exactly right that, you know, uh, the message of Jesus is going to call some to recognize and some to recognize their failures and others to recognize the blessings. And think of this as we as we begin to think about what Simeon is saying to us today. How many times when we're paying attention, does Jesus and his spirit in our lives, the Holy Spirit, point out to us, you're on the wrong track, you're on the right track, right? But there are people today who are making the decision not to believe. And so at some point, they will fall. At least by eternity, if nothing else. Look at 35. And then he says this, so that the... Thoughts of, of many hearts will be revealed. 
the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Now, I put this in your outline because I want you to grab this today. When you really reflect on it, what does your thought reveal? So when you really think about a circumstance in your life, what does it really reveal about your thoughts? Well, are you thinking in terms, are you wanting in terms of our attitude, where our heart is, are we, are our thoughts geared toward not so much the emotion, but the loving that should be within us? Is everything's always thinking, do everything with love? So, so Beverly's asking a very convoluted question, so I'm not sure how to answer it. So, um, those of you on Zoom, I'm glad you're there today, all right? So, so yeah, Beverly, I would say that, that one way I want you to look at this is when we really experience life, what does it reveal about our thinking? Most of the time, I think it reveals my thinking is wrong. <laughs> so Laura says most of the time she it reveals that her thinking's wrong, and that's probably true for all of us. So, so give me, let me give you some examples. You're going to the supermarket, you're in a rush, you pull in, and somebody else is getting ready to pull in the spot. You know, life reveals your thinking, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you go, okay, I can beat them to that spot, okay? That's revealing your thinking. <laughs> yeah, that, that reveals your thinking. That's right. You, you tell them, you give them a piece of your mind, right? So it reveals your thinking. Life reveals your thinking. When someone says something to you and you think it, but you may not say it, it reveals your thinking. So look, I asked the question in your outline, what do you want your heart to reveal? So one of the most important things that you can do in your faith walk, I believe, is to be somewhat analytical on what your heart is showing you. Because then you can begin to turn that over to the Lord. Okay, you can begin to pray about that and dwell on that and contemplate it and study scripture on it. Uh, maybe even have an accountability partner in your life and say, you know what, I, I really saw a side of me that I didn't like today. I was I was dealing with this and this, this, uh, this was really on my mind a lot. This is what I thought about. It reveals your heart. Okay. And Simeon, again, this is what he says. So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And there are people who, because they are struggling with their concept of God, or maybe they've rejected God, uh, their hearts begin to show themselves. Okay? Maybe in the names they call you, or the things they think about you, or what they say about you. Hearts are revealed. And the same thing can happen to us. So just be sensitive to that, and it may be helpful. Now, let's go to the first Yes. I yes. uh, just happened to be using the message today. And it says the rejection will force honesty. So I think. Force honesty. Okay. I like that. When the, when the people are um, misunderstood and contradicted, the pain of a sword thrusts through you. So when the powers that be start weigh, weighing in against you, that rejection will force honesty. And it, I believe that that means that that's when the Holy Spirit starts to get involved. When you start being forced to accept those honest, those, those reality and the truth. Yeah, that, that's well said. Uh, we, we like to, I like to teach our management, management team that um, under pressure, you see the true nature of somebody. Under pressure, you see the true nature of somebody. And so that's a time when you can begin to say, okay, that's really how they think and that's really how they act and react. Now, what do we do about that? How do we help them to get control of that? How do we help reduce those triggers that create those situations? So even as believers at times, we can actually be triggered and suddenly respond like we're not a believer. Or act like we're not a believer. Maybe represent poorly the kingdom, right? 
it can happen to us. And it often is when we're triggered or there's a pressure. And trigger and pressure are sometimes the same thing. So I, I'll stay off of that for now. Um, verse 38. This is Anna speaking now. Um, verse 38, she says this. Coming up to them at the very moment, she gives gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So she spoke about the redemption of Jerusalem. Some of your translations will say the redemption of Israel. Okay. So what is that about? What is, what is, what are, what are we talking about here? Why did Luke bring this up? So you spoke in your sermon this morning about what the word redemption means. So if Jerusalem was enslaved by the Romans, she was speaking about the redemption, the release of of the believers in Jerusalem. Yeah, so, so Laura mentions about the redemption of, of Israel and, and Jerusalem from the Roman occupation. And, and that is true. Um, she's really talking, though, about another level entirely. And this is what I want you to get today, I hope, is that we're talking about the redemption of people. Jerusalem is a <coughs> symbol of Israel. It is today. Uh, that's why so many Jewish people were so elated when President Trump moved the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It was symbolic to a Jewish person that this is their, this is their cultural, religious, uh, legal uh, entity. It's, it's, their, it's their center, right? Um, it would be today for most of us in America, if suddenly they move the seat of the federal government out of Washington, D.C., we'd say, wait a minute, it, it has to be in Washington, D.C. That's where it's supposed to be because we're used to it. It's, it's tradition. It's culture, right? Now, there are times we want D.C. to be imploded and maybe bombed. I mean, that's our privilege, right, is, is in a democracy. But, but I, I think that you have to respect and appreciate that Anna's talking about the redemption of the people of Israel, that they will no longer be bound by other people, that they will be free. They won't be slaves anymore. Okay. All right. Now, yes, sir. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, if that's the case, uh, the Jewish people were enslaved until they became a nation to other people in 1948. Correct. So, it, you know, God doesn't do things in, in five or ten years or even a decade or two. So it, it took 15, 1800 years. Yeah, Eric brought out a great point that, uh, you know, really until Israel became a nation in 1948, uh, by act of the United Nations with the push of the United States and, and Truman in particular, um, who was not really a religious man. It's interesting how God works, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we're talking from Jesus' time and even before that, they were an occupied country. They never really had their national status back, right? But I want you to also see, and I asked this question, did it happen in Jesus' time? And Eric's already beat us to the punch, right? It did not. So the Messiah came and Israel was not redeemed in the way they thought they should be. Now, this is a trick question. Did it happen in Jesus' time? And the answer is yes, it did. We're still in Jesus' time. It, it, well, we still are in Jesus' time. You're right, Julie. But it did happen during Jesus' 33 years on the earth but not in the way the people expected. He redeemed them by giving them the opportunity for eternal life and a relationship with the creator God, right? They were thinking in terms of, hey, we're going to be in control of our own destiny. We're going to be our own nation. We're not going to be occupied anymore. And that is a way of redemption. But Anna's talking about something deeper here, that God would redeem the people from the bonds of slavery. All right. Now, 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul says it this way. You were bought 
for a price. And he's telling the church in Corinth and reminding us today that there was a price paid for our freedom, for our redemption, right? And I asked the question in your outline, what was that price? The price was the crucifixion. The price was the life of Jesus, okay? Yeah, it was, that was the price that was paid, all right? Now, what's that price today? Kennedy says total submission. We have to give up our life up to him. Beverly says we have to give our life up to him. Okay. Similar, right? It's a gift. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Ephesians even says not by your own doing, right? So that anyone can boast. It is a gift. So that's a correct answer. I'm going to put a twist on that for just a second. Okay. What's the price today? It's the same as it was when Jesus died. Um, in the, the movie, um, Mel Gibson, that, that was the crucifixion. What was it called? Um, passion. The Passion. Thank you. The Passion um, supposedly... Um, when, when Jesus was being nailed to the cross in the movie, uh, you see a set of hands. It's Mel Gibson's hands. Okay, now, apparently he, he, he does some really bizarre things at times. But at that time, he, he, he was of the mind where I'm the one who crucified Jesus. And if you think about that, every time we break relationship with God, every time we sin... <clears throat> We're crucifying Jesus all over again. We're nailing him to the cross. And so Mel Gibson, for all the screwy things he does still, he had that right. He had that right. That if you think about it, every time we sin, we're telling Jesus who died on the cross for that sin, um, it, it wasn't good enough for me. I, I'm going to do it my own way. Right? And so I, I want you to appreciate that the price was the cross and it's one and done. Um, in Timothy, it, it tells us that, you know, once and for all is the way it describes it. Once and for all. Jesus doesn't need to be crucified every day. But sometimes we re-crucify him when we say, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to follow that. All right. Now. I want to just give you a quick lesson on some of the basic stages of redemption. There are plenty here. We've talked about this a little bit in another lesson recently, but I wanted to give you another twist to it, okay? And I put on your outline, bondage, redeemer, ransom, and freedom, okay? For us to really understand our faith really well, we have to recognize that something bonds us, makes us under bondage, enslaves us, if you will. The Redeemer, of course, is Jesus. The ransom that was paid was his death on the cross, the blood of the cross. And the freedom that we have is, as I just told you, a couple of different places, but particularly in Timothy, once and for all. So our price was paid once and for all. Which is why sometimes in most Protestant denominations, we say it here sometimes, um, that, that Jesus died for those before, during, and after his earthly life, right? He died for all men, all ages, all times. So it's not just for those who happen to be standing there witnessing him dying on the cross. And it's not just for those who come to Round Hill United Methodist Church. It's not just for those who have memorized X number of scriptures. It's for all people, all times, right? So everybody can be bound by something. You can be under bondage for anything. There are people who are under bondage with 
money. Uh, they're under bondage about worry. They're under bondage about hate or prejudice. Um, they're under bondage because there's someone who screwed them over in their lives and they're never going to forgive them, right? They're under bondage to that. So I, I want you to appreciate that, you know, you can, you can watch TV and you can see somebody who's in prison and they've done all these atrocious, terrible criminal things. And you can say they're under bondage, right? I'm not sure if Doug Rinker isn't under the same bondage that they're in. It's just different titles, right? It may not be murder. It may not that I robbed a bank and killed three people. Okay, but what holds me from being the godly person that God asked me to be? And all of us have something in our life that can bond us, can enslave us. But I want you to remember that with bondage, there is an opportunity for a redeemer to take care of us. And a redeemer is a very biblical concept in the Old Testament that we read about a lot. But even today, in fact, in the sermon today, I mentioned uh, Christian Solidarity International that is still redeeming slaves in, in South Sudan even today. They've got about 35,000 more that they're trying to raise funds for. And there are churches, uh, Adam Hamilton's church, um, uh, uh, Purpose Driven Life, uh, Rick Warren, his church supports them a lot. Um, they're sending money over there, and for literally $50 a head, in some cases, they're able to buy a slave out of slavery and free them. It's happening in Virginia. There's a safe house in Roanoke that's taking women out of sex trafficking every day. Yep. I mean, Virginia's the fifth worst state for sex yep. slaves in the country. Yep. So there is still slavery today, but I do want you to appreciate that you and I can also be enslaved by our attitudes, by our hurts, by our wants, by our desires, uh, by addictions, uh, we can all be enslaved. Now, Doug, I want to, yes, go ahead. I, th I think about people, we as Christians being enslaved by religion. <clears throat> Instead of uh, having faith, we sometimes get, I mean, it's easy to point out the examples in the secular world like bad stuff but we do it in the church all the time because we get in bondage over religion like uh for instance all the different um ways people think that baptism is done right and wrong all the different ways they think communion has to be done right or wrong those we're we're guilty of that on many levels as well as you know the bad people out there because we think we're good i mean some religions you have to wear a little hat a certain way uh women can't wear pants i mean it goes on and on within god's people as well and i think uh we have to be very careful about that that we have faith and not religion that, that's a great point, Julie. I appreciate you bringing that up today because, uh, you know, we you're going to have to look in a mirror and, and think about that. We, we mentioned earlier, uh, what does your heart reveal? And sometimes when you begin to say, you know, and, and listen, I'm telling you, when you begin to pray, Lord, reveal to me what keeps me under bondage. Um, I, that's. I got to be honest with you. That's like praying, Lord, give me patience. It's, it's a hard prayer. If you're sincere about it, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's going to start coming to mind and you're going to suddenly realize, Oh, wow, that is holding me back. Oh my goodness. I do see that. I am going to challenge you to pray that way. I'm just telling you, reach out to others because it beats you up pretty good. OK, it beats you up pretty good. Just like when you say to somebody, if they're really on it, I want you to really be honest with me. And I want you to tell me um, how how are other people seeing me? And after about 30 seconds, you go, OK, OK, that's enough. That's enough. Stop. OK. And, and so sometimes when we say to God, God, reveal my heart. 
Let me see what's holding me back. What's holding me? What's got me enslaved? What's bonding me up? And sometimes you go, oh, okay, God, that's enough. That's enough for now. Okay. All right. Now, Galatians 4. Let me read Galatians 4, 4 to 7, because it really draws the point again. Um, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. That's the manger scene, right? Born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So the last two questions, and we'll wrap it up today. What do we do with our freedom? Once you begin to pray, God, reveal to me what I have, what I am doing wrong. Reveal to me what's holding me back. Reveal to me what is enslaved me or put me in chains. Now comes the hard part. What do you do with that freedom when you get it? And then how should we live as those who have been redeemed? Well, I mean, this is kind of what I was getting at with the total submission. If you still hang on and refuse to lay down your own life, you're not going to feel the freedom. You're not going to feel the redemption. It's just going to be, you're in a constant battle at that point. And without truly just submitting, you don't get the redemption. You don't get the freedom. Well said. So without true submission, you really don't get true freedom. And so I just challenge you this week to, to think about this. What holds you back? Again, like I told you, sometimes you go, okay, God, that's enough for now. Um, but I, I do encourage you to challenge yourself to pray for that, to find out what's God revealed to me, what's holding me back. And it may not be a visit from an angel. It might be that you look in the mirror and recognize this or this or this. And it might be in reading scripture, suddenly it comes to you. It might be in your prayer time. Or it might be somebody that you can trust. Maybe that doesn't know you well, but you can trust them. And they may say to you, hey, I've noticed this. Or if you really have enough guts, you ask somebody who will be honest with you. What do you think is holding me back? You know, and, and they may tell you. If you're a newlywed, you may want to hold off on that, okay? Just thought. Uh, so how should we live our lives as those who have been redeemed? And I think that's, Kennedy said it so well, we end with that. We need to be submissive to God. We need total submission to God. We need to make sure that we are willing to lay down our life for him. Ask the question at the bottom, what will you do with your freedom? What will you do with your freedom? Let's end in a word of prayer. Father God, we recognize that you brought us into the family. You've made us heir, heirs. You, we've been adopted to sonship and daughtership. We, we've been brought into the family by the sacrifice of the baby Jesus. Help us to figure out what's holding us back, Lord. Help us to be totally submissive, all in, completely invested, 100% into it, that we might be the people you called us to be, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a safe week. See you next week. Thank you.